Now, before we begin and we talk about this week's gauntlet for the gold, make sure you do your part. If you want me to have to buy the four disc Jeff Jarrett TNA DVD set, have to watch all four discs and then review it right here as part of the retro wrestling review series on OTRS Central. You got to go to the OTRS Central store at Pro Wrestling Tees and hashtag buy a shirt. This one right here, the Assume Jeff Jarrett position shirt. And if 15 of them are sold by September 30th, that's your reward. That's what you get. And that's how you sadistic fucks will choose to punish me. It doesn't matter if one person buys 15. One buys 10 and somebody else buys five. Three of you buy five, 15 of you buy one apiece. That's all it takes. Just get to 15 shirts sold and they'll hold up my end of the bargain and cuss every one of you out along the way. So make sure you go to the OTR Central Store Pro Wrestling Tees and hashtag buy the shirt. I'm just saying. Anyways, let's talk about Impact this week. And I actually... Even though still there were those things that frustrated me, even though still there was some stupid stuff that just left me scratching my head about how does this make any sense whatsoever, I think in large part because so much of the show was devoted towards building towards that gauntlet for the gold match since basically the entire second hour of the show was taken up by the gauntlet for the gold match. You had less stupid crap that happened on the show. Less chance to put in pointless filler. It was pretty much you're going to hit on things that matter, things that you've been dealing with quite a bit, and the rest of it can be pushed off to another week. And in that case, it was kind of refreshing. And in that particular case, it made it kind of an enjoyable show to me, especially based off of who ultimately won the GFW Global Championship. Now, you start off with Bobby Lashley and his MMA dojo, gym, whatever the fuck they call it, entourage coming to the building. And of course the founder has to sit there and make sure he gets his camera time. And that seems like what this is all about and why. What is the point of this? These guys assaulted a referee last week, came over the barricade, and basically did whatever the hell they wanted. Why in the world would you allow them onto private property when you do not have to? Why wouldn't you immediately already have the police there ready because you know that they're probably going to come and then escort them the hell out of there? Wouldn't that be the logical, sensible thing to do? And then when we're getting into it backstage, like, I can see what's coming. And fuck you, GFW, if that's where you're going. There could be another direction that they're going for Bound for Glory with Bobby Lashley. And that's probably where they're going. But again, this is just all about the founder having to get his fucking camera time. He just can't help himself. He just can't help himself. Then you got something I actually enjoy. Jim Cornette's speech to 18 of the guys talking about the gauntlet for the gold and... You know, another thing that tied into the the main event of the night, tied, tied into the fact that you had some major stakes at line. Everybody had a chance to potentially walk out at the end of the night, the GFW Global Champion. So even though Cornette's being corny about he's going to find Lashley and then he's going to pretend like we don't know who the surprise person is since we just saw the video package for him last week, it makes it kind of anticlimactic. I'm just saying... I still enjoyed the speech because, again, it was kind of short, sweet, to the point, and it touched on the most important thing that was going to happen on the show, the most important thing in the company, which is the world championship. And that's cool. OVE took on the Heat Seekers, and this was frustrating only in the sense of this is the match they should have had for their debut last week. The Heat Seekers went out there and did what the hell they were supposed to do. They did their jobs. They did their job. And they did everything they could to look make OVE look good. I don't know if the Ohio versus everything concept works. I don't know if these guys are going to be productive members of the roster ultimately. I don't know if Fool Killer is going to view them as Motor City Machine Gun substitutes and feel like he could be nut huggers for them. I don't know. But at least I will say this. With the stupidity of last week's debut match and how stupid that was, if you were choosing to give them a showcase match against jobbers, then this is how it is supposed to be done. 
This makes you more inclined to be interested in OVE, not the no-name, non-roster member opponents that they're facing. So if nothing else, we rectified the wrongs of last week. And we get the returning Taryn Terrell in her whatever slut garb you wanted to call that look. Um, and her promos about Gail Kim. And I will say this, anything that is an excuse to keep Gail Kim away from the knockouts title, I am perfectly fine with. Now, to me, you should be finding a way to have your um, women's champion, your knockouts champion, be featured on TV in some way. But again, with the constraints of what they had with this show, because they had the gauntlet for the gold match, I understand they had to hit some of the high points, some of the um, key things, and then move the hell along. And they did that. So Taryn Terrell, Gail Kim, even though I know they've been there before, uh, for me, it'll still feel kind of fresh, so I'm okay with it. Cornette is confronted backstage by Bobby Lashley and his crew, and this whole thing was just kind of dumb, and it keeps coming back to the thing, well, you got to make a choice. you got to make a choice. What's your choice going to be? My choice is, is to think that this is all stupid. Why are you trying to emphasize or push the fact that Lashley could be leaving? Why are you trying to give these MMA guys television time when you simply don't have to? Last time I checked, you're not on Spike anymore. They're not forcing you to push Bellator. Why in the hell would you be pushing these people when there is really no reason whatsoever to be putting them on your television? Each week, I don't get it. Just to sit there and pump this up and build this up, it almost seems like what you're trying to get towards is Bobby Lashley versus King Mo at Bound for Glory. And is that really the direction you want to go? Or are we going towards Bobby Lashley and the fucking founder of Bountiful Glory? And who the hell would want to see that? Either way, the end result to, seems to me, since Bound, Bound for Glory, it looks like Bobby Lashley is actually on their featured poster November 5th. Why in the hell would I want to see either one of those fights, either one of those matches? I'm just saying. So the whole premise, the whole notion here to me is completely and totally ridiculous. Just like the premise of anything and everything involving Grado on my television each week is completely and totally ridiculous. And a fan like me can only dream that this story was actually shoot and Grado would be deported and get the fuck out of the country. I can't stand this stupid ass annoying character. There is nothing likable about this dude anyways. Absolutely nothing likable. And the whole time I'm sitting there, it finally dawned on me. I said, wait, they're looking for somebody that's American to marry him, which would be how this would work in order for him to get his visa to be able to stay in the country. Why wouldn't Joseph Park, who is American, last I checked, enter into a legal arrangement, which it would be, and marry Grado him damn self? All this pursuing of women and knockouts on the roster and everything else, wouldn't the easy, most sensible thing have been to have Joseph Park marry Grado? And if you want to get attention on your product, and at this point in time, honestly, Impact Wrestling as a show and Global Force Wrestling as a brand needs as much attention as they possibly can. Do you remember 15 years ago or so, whatever the hell it was, 2002, 2003, when Billy and Chuck were going to get married on SmackDown and how much attention that got? Granted, this is not going to be as big of a deal now because it's not WWE and gay marriage is legalized in this country now. But again, from a legal standpoint, wouldn't it make more logical sense for a Joseph Park who is an American to enter into a contractual agreement with Grado to get married when that type of marriage is now legalized? I'm just fucking saying. So it's literally weeks of wasting time and circle jerking when the answer, the obvious solution was staring you in the face the whole time. And instead of going down a more controversial path and perhaps getting some new attention on your product, you went down a completely different typical type of wrestling path and it's lame. And what the fuck, all of a sudden Laurel Van Ness isn't batshit anymore? Like what the fuck's up with that? All of a sudden she comes out now and she's perfectly fucking normal? Granted, much easier to look at with them with all the makeup and shit. But why is she not crazy anymore? Why did she figure out how to put her lipstick on all the fucking sudden? And on top of that, the whole premise of her seeing something in Grado and now she's the one that wants to marry him, she's proposing to him, doesn't change the fact that Laurel Van Ness is still Canadian. And that is not how any of this works, I assure you. 
And then on top of that, does she not watch the product that the company puts out on television? Can she not see what he is clearly trying to do? Has she not seen what everybody else sees and that he only wants to marry her to be able to stay in the freaking country, which again, since she's a Canadian citizen, it's not how any of this works. Who's writing this crap? Unbelievable stupidity of the highest order. And then again, she wants to marry the guy that when she was in distress, he cut tail and freaking run? And then, of course, the awkwardness of now Tyrus isn't there. So when Congo Kong's out, you have somebody else completely random just fucking appear out of the picture out of nowhere. How the fuck did this Indian fucking dude get right there? Did he teleport there? Did he come through the floor? Was he just sitting out in the freaking crowd at random and then he just comes out to confront Congo Kong? Again, how does any of this fucking work? How does any of this make goddamn sense? Why would she want to marry a guy that is intentionally trying to use her and then when she was in distress, cut tail and run, defeating the whole premise of the man being... Pro pro ah, fuck it, who cares anymore? This whole story's stupid and the quicker it's done, the better. But let's talk about the main event of the night which is Gauntlet for the Gold. Now, maybe it's because I had been away for a while. Maybe it's because this was a new concept for them. I really don't know. And you can enlighten me in the comments if you choose to. That's fine. But I did not know if Gauntlet for the Gold was going to be actually a gauntlet match with 20 people or it was going to be a Royal Rumble style match. But for copyright reasons, we can't call it a Battle Royal or a Royal Rumble. We're going to sit there and call it Gauntlet for the Gold. So I was a little confused there. But... Obviously, easily enough, I was able to figure it all out. This is where you got the debut of Johnny Impact, and that's cool for this company. Again, they could use whatever type of talent they possibly can get their hands on at this point. But the whole premise of this was about Eli Drake earlier on in the night when he's talking to Cornette backstage. He's trying to get a different number than one, so, so then Cornette gives him number two, which is just kind of dumb in and of itself and a waste of time. But you basically went the Shawn Michaels British Bulldog route with Eli Drake and Eddie Edwards. And you know what? It really worked for me. I was perfectly fine with it. As this match went along and the drama unfolded and it was building up and building up, I was looking forward to that moment where because I was able to avoid the spoilers... And even when I saw something that involved that said, how could somebody release this or how could you see that or I would see spoilers, I was able to avoid it. So this actually was legitimately new for me. I did not know who was going to be the next GFW Global Champion. It was very refreshing. Um, one thing that was head scratching to me, low keys in there at number 20. LAX wants to make sure that he's not getting screwed. So why wouldn't the hell wouldn't LAX get involved in this match more? Why wouldn't they do it their part to make sure that Loki won the title? So not only has the faction been stupid in a lot of ways, they literally are stupid. And then especially when you read the ad, ah, fuck it, it's not even a spoiler at this point, but be warned to find out that Loki isn't even going to be with the company after October. Why did you put him into this type of spot? knowing that he could potentially leave, knowing that apparently you didn't have him locked up anything long-term or you didn't care to have him locked up anything long-term. Only this company, after all these years, would still do this type of stupid crap. It's like when he did the whole storyline with AJ Styles, what was it, in 2013? Oh, this is all a work. He's not going to leave team. No, legitimately, it was a fucking shoot. They didn't have the guy under contract. They decided they were going to put the title on him and hope he, he could use that as some leverage to keep him, and then they decided not to. Unbelievable. But you get to the final two after everybody else has been eliminated. Uh, Ethan Carter III, when he got when he did his thing with that uh, standby wrestler, that was funny. And then even when he was eliminated, you know, just the facials is like, oh, that's, that dude's cool. But to me, it's one of three guys that should have won this. It was Ethan Carter III, Moose, or Eli Drake. Those are the three guys to me right now for this company that they should be building around. Well, EC3 didn't win it. Moose didn't win it. But lo and behold, Eli Drake did win it. And I popped a little bit. I was like, hell fucking yes. This company got something right. And just as I'm sitting there and celebrating, I'm like, this is cool. They've got somebody with, as the world champion that I give a shit about. Then lo and behold, what do you know? It all becomes about fucking Lashley and his goddamn entourage. And they're doing the same shit again. 
So we're putting over these guys that have no business being on your television to fucking begin with. All of these guys that are associated with Bobby Lashley, who, by the way, didn't win the match at the end of everything being all said and done on the night. We're taking the shine and the focus away from Eli Drake. He is the GFW fucking global champion. I don't care what you're wanting to set up with Lashley. I don't care about anything else. But after the gauntlet for the gold match, and he's been named the winner, and he gets that belt for the first time, it should be all about, guess what? Ding dong, dumb dicks, Eli Drake. Instead, you shift the focus over to fucking Lashley and stuff to the point where you finally come back to Eli Drake. It's like, oh, I forgot he won the title. Oh, I guess it really doesn't fucking matter. So even when this company does something good, when this company makes a smart decision, when this company gets behind a decent horse, a thoroughbred, they still find a way to undercut themselves and they still find a way to do stupid shit like this. It's ridiculous. This was Eli Drake's time. This was Eli Drake's moment. Don't be focusing on this other bullshit. Teach the fans that this is your new top guy. Teach the fans that this is the guy you need to see. That this is the guy that everything is going to revolve around. Not Bobby Lashley and his wannabe MMA fucking crew. Ridiculous. But anyways, I'm the Schleg Daddy. And this is OTR Essential. God damn it, even when this company does something right, they still find a way to screw it up. That's kind of their business model over the past 15 years. Name changes, a lot of the bullshit stays the same. But remember with OTRS Central, it's not the wrestling show you want, just the wrestling show you need. And importantly, remember, even when you have great moments like Eli Drake winning the GFW Global Champion, ultimately remember, I watch this shit so you don't have to. So you can thank me by watching my videos, subscribing, and doing your part to hashtag buy a shirt. Later.